Hey guys, this video is on structure, pressure, and temperature effects on solubility. We'll first look at structure effects, how the structure of the molecules, the solute and the solvent molecules, affect the solubility of that solution, of the solute and that solution. So um, like dissolves like is the same. What that, what that says, what that tells us is that um, a solute that is close in polarity to a solvent is uh, going to be more soluble in that solvent than a solute whose polarity is less similar. So if a solvent is very polar, then a more polar solute will just have a greater solubility than a less polar solute in that solvent. And vice versa, if we have a non-polar solvent, then the more non-polar a solute is, the greater its solubility in that solvent at a given temperature. So for example, let's say our solvent is carbon tetrachloride. This is a very non-polar solvent. And if we want to dissolve either of these two molecules, this is n-pentane, C5H12, and this is water, um, because the solvent is very non-polar, um, the, the solute that's going to dissolve best, have the greatest solubility, will be the one that's the least polar. Well, Remember, any molecule that only has carbons and hydrogens in it will be nonpolar. Um, N-pentane, C5H12, is definitely nonpolar. Um, carbon tetrachloride is nonpolar. Um, by the way, we know this is nonpolar because, one, it's symmetric. The shape is tetrahedral, and there are you know, all the poles cancel, right? This is a nonpolar compound. Um, now, on the other hand, water is a very polar molecule. We know that. And so that means that it's going to be much less soluble in carbon tetrachloride than in pentane would. So let's do a little example here. We want to figure out for each of these compounds, cesium bromide, formaldehyde, and n pentane, which solvent will be best, methanol or benzene. So for cesium bromide, which solvent will be best, methanol or benzene, for formaldehyde, and for n pentane. So why don't you guys figure this out real quick, and when you get an answer, come on back. Welcome back, guys. So, first of all, um, this is the structure, the Lewis structure for methanol. We see it is definitely a polar molecule. Um, the electronegativity of carbon is 2.5, oxygen is 3.5, difference here is 1.0, um, hydrogen is 2.1, oxygen is 3.5, difference is um, 1.4, so definitely polar molecule, not symmetric. Whereas, now, this is benzene, and just given the formula, if you guys didn't know what the structure of benzene is, um, you would not be able to figure out definitively that this is the structure. There is more than one reasonable way to write C6H6, you know, a little structure for that, that compound. But this is it, so just so you know. But we don't need to know that, really, because remember, any compound that has only carbon and hydrogen in it is nonpolar. And that's what we care about here is, is this molecule polar or nonpolar, right? So we have a polar solvent and we have a nonpolar solvent. So now let's look at the solutes. Cesium bromide, this is an ionic compound. Cesium's electronegativity we know is definitely less than one. Bromine's 2.8, so the difference is, you know, large. It's a, an ionic compound. And an ionic compound is essentially a very, very, very polar compound. And so that means we want the most polar solvent. That would be methanol. Um, formaldehyde, this is the Lewis structure for formaldehyde. Um, this is also a polar molecule. Um, oxygen is 3.5 electronegativity, carbon is 2.5, difference is 1.0. This is not a symmetric compound, it's trigonal planar, um, with oxygen being different than the hydrogen. So this is a polar molecule. That means we want the more polar solid, methanol. And finally for n-pentane, only carbons and hydrogens. We actually saw the structure a couple, a couple minutes ago, but just knowing that there's only carbon and hydrogen in this, we know this is a nonpolar molecule. As I saw you, we want the most nonpolar solvent, which would definitely be benzene. All right. So now the effect of pressure on solubility. First of all, the pressure above a solution does not affect the solubility of a solid or a liquid in a, in a liquid solution. So we're talking about liquid solutions here. Um, but the pressure above a solution does affect the solubility of a gas. And in particular, the partial pressure of the gas that's being dissolved in that solution is affected, um, affects the solubility of that gas in the solution. 
So this picture down here is showing a solution with a gas dissolved in it. The little spheres would be the gas. And th there are some of them above the solution too. And they've reached an equilibrium. So what's happening is the, the solute, the gas, is um, some molecules are escaping, some are returning. It's at equilibrium, so we have a certain number escaping and returning at the same time. Um, and we have a certain number dissolved, that's solubility. Now as we increase the pressure of that gas above the solution, more molecules will be hitting the surface of that liquid at any given time. It's going to shift the equilibrium to having more molecules in the solution. So we increase the solubility of that gas, and this is it coming back to equilibrium again. So it doesn't matter what the um, total pressure above the solution is, only the partial pressure of the gas is being dissolved. For example, if you have a bottle of beer, the solubility of the carbon dioxide, which is what gives it its, its fizz in that, that beer, um, depends upon the partial pressure of carbon dioxide above that solution, not the, not the total pressure. So let's do, um, look at Henry's Law. Henry's Law lets us calculate basically the solubility of a gas in a solution. It's a real simple equation, C equals Kp, where C is the concentration of the gas in solution, and we'll use units of molarity. Um, K is Henry's Law constant, and the value for Henry's Law constant depends both on what the solute is and what the solvent is. And we'll use un units of molarity per atmosphere. And P here is just the partial pressure of the dissolved gas above the solution. So P would be the partial pressure of carbon dioxide above the bottle of beer. So here's a little example. Um, we're told that the gauge pressure of carbon dioxide in a keg of beer is 12 psi, which is definitely about what it would be. Um, now, what gauge pressure means, you need to know this to do the problem, it means the pressure above and beyond whatever atmospheric pressure is. So if atmospheric pressure above that keg is one atmosphere, well, well say 14.7 um, psi, then the total pressure inside of that keg, which is going to be all carbon dioxide, because in this keg we're assuming that it's been purged of anything but carbon dioxide, the total pressure above that solution is just carbon dioxide, will be the 12 psi plus the 14.7 psi or, or whatever it is. Um, so that's what gauge pressure is. We know the gauge pressure of the um, carbon dioxide in that keg of beer. Atmospheric pressure is 0.9953 atmospheres and Henry's Law constant for this beer carbon dioxide solution at the temperature of the solution, let's say, is 0 0.034 molar, molar per atmosphere. What is the molarity of carbon dioxide in the beer? So this is going to be a Henry's Law problem, problem, of course. Go ahead and work it out, guys, and when you get an answer, come on back. Welcome back, guys. So Henry's Law constant, um, we're looking for C, the concentration and molarity of the carbon dioxide. First thing we're going to do is we're going to convert the gauge pressure of the carbon dioxide into atmospheres. Remember, one atmosphere is equal to 14.70 psi. We saw this back in the gas chapter in um, Chem 101. And so we get the um, gauge pressure of carbon dioxide being about 0.82 atmospheres. That means that the total pressure of carbon dioxide inside that keg above the beer is going to be the atmospheric pressure, we were told was 0.9953 atmospheres, plus the gauge pressure, which is 0.816 atmospheres, so about 1.81 atmospheres total pressure of carbon dioxide. That's our P in Henry's Law. We are given the value for the Henry's Law constant, 0 0.034 molar per atmosphere. So we take the constant times the pressure, and we see that the concentration of carbon dioxide in that beer is about 0 0.062 molar. The effect of temperature on um, aqueous solutions. So here we're talking about a, a well, a liquid solution. Um, of a solid um, or another liquid in what would be pretty much water, but any liquid really. Um, so increasing the temperature of a solution, this is for a solid dissolved in water, as it forms increases the rate at which the solid dissolves. It dissolves faster when you heat it up, but how it affects how much solid will dissolve depends on what the solid is and what the so solvent is. In this case, it's water. Sometimes it's going to increase and sometimes it's going to decrease. So if we look at this graph, we can see that um, all these blue lines, um, the solubility, this is the solubility in grams of the solute per 100 grams of water, the y-axis. 
and this is a temperature in degrees Celsius, the solubility of these compounds with the blue lines increase as we increase the temperature. But there are some compounds whose solubility decreases as we increase the temperature. In this graph, that would be sodium sulfate here and cerium-3 sulfate right here. They decrease as we increase the temperature. So another example. Let's say we dissolve 89 grams or attempt to dissolve 89 grams of sodium sulfate in 150 grams of water at 40 Celsius. Then we heat the solution up to 80 degrees Celsius. What will happen? By this I mean, um, will anything precipitate out? Will something more dissolve? You know, what's going to happen in terms of solubility? And we're going to use this graph for this problem. So once you guys figure this one out, when you get an answer, come on back. Welcome back, guys. So first, we're going to see if all the sodium sulfate dissolves initially at the 40 Celsius. So from the graph, we see that at 40 Celsius, which is right here, about 60 grams of sodium sulfate, this right here, will dissolve. So if we have 100 in 100 grams of water. So if we have 150 grams of water and 60 grams of sodium sulfate will dissolve per 100 grams of water. This is using the solubility as a conversion factor, by the way. We see that we can dissolve 90 grams of sodium sulfate. We put 89 grams in, so yes, it will all dissolve. Okay, so that's the first thing. We're starting out with a, an, uh, an unsaturated but almost saturated solution, but everything's dissolved. <clears throat> Now, at um, 80 Celsius, what happens? Well, we see from this graph that as we increase the temperature from 40 to 80 Celsius, the solubility of sodium sulfate decreases. And at 80 degrees Celsius, I approximate this as being about 50 grams. Yes, you know, you read it from the graph. About 50 grams of um, sodium sulfate will dissolve at 80 Celsius in 100 grams of water. So if we have 150, we have the same amount of water. 150 grams of water times 50 grams of sodium sulfate per 100 grams of water that will dissolve we see that 75 grams of sodium sulfate will stay dissolved at the higher temperature. The difference between what we put in and how much will stay dissolved at this higher temperature is how much will precipitate out. So we put in 89 grams minus 75 that stay dissolved. We have What will happen is 14 grams of sodium sulfate will crystallize out of solution. So we'll see solid white solids starting to form. Now, for a gas, increasing the temperature of that solution always decreases the solubility of any gas in that solution. And this is just showing the solubility of some gases as we increase the temperature. They all go down. And basically the reason is as we increase the temperature, um, we give the, um, the gas more average kinetic energy, which means the molecules are moving faster and they have more energy to escape from the solution. So less will dissolve. So for, um, this is useful you know, um, at times. There are some chemical reactions that we do in aqueous solutions that we are, need to be really careful about the pH. And it ends up with the acidity of the solution. It ends up the, ca the carbon dioxide that's in the atmosphere that will naturally dissolve in the water if you just let it sit out um, affects the, the, the pH because it forms carbonic acid and makes it more acidic. Um, so sometimes we have to get rid of that carbon dioxide as much as we can. So if we heat it up, we decrease the solubility and we can get rid of a lot of that carbon dioxide. All right. and that's all there is to it, guys.